What makes a forest haunted? Well, when specters roam the fields and lurk from behind trees watching you pass by, or when a nasty little critter takes up residence, eating everything that moves, that's when a forest becomes haunted. So it's time to get lost in the trees and undergrowth and see what kind of haunts we can find. These are allegedly true scary stories from haunted forests. If you want to have your story narrated, share it with us at darknessprevails.org. The Devil Woman of the Caribbean from Boyd H. Location, the Caribbean Islands. Though they're just small pieces of land surrounded by water with minor populations, the Caribbean is still a severely haunted place where evil lurks in the darkest corners of villages and deep forests. When the Europeans began their conquest of the New World centuries ago, many made land in the Caribbean, in particular the French. Islands such as St. Martin, Guadalupe, and Martinique are still entirely French-speaking to this day. As the dark aspects of both African and French cultures intertwined, it gave birth to evil entities that still terrify local islanders. One in particular is known as La Diablesse, which is the French word for female devil, or as the locals refer to her as the devil woman of the Caribbean. She is the evil spirit of a woman and practitioner of old African black magic. In her human form, she appears as a seductress that dresses in traditional West Indian garb with a wide-brimmed hat to cover her hideous face and a long skirt that reaches to the floor to conceal her most distinct and revealing feature, which is that one of her feet is that of a cow's hoof. She lingers on deserted roads awaiting unsuspecting men, whom she leads astray with her charm into the dark of the forests, causing them to become lost, disoriented, and ultimately perish as a result while trying to find their way back home. La Diablesse then claims their souls after she causes their untimely departures. This particular account comes from my late grandfather on my mother's side, it takes place on the island of Trinidad in the early 1940s. My grandfather was a descendant of a handful of remaining English settlers during the British rule of the island. He was just 17 years old at the time and had not yet met my grandmother. Back in the day, Trinidad was not as populated or as industrialized as it is now, hence manual labor was more prominent in agriculture seeing as the island's major exports were cocoa and sugarcane. He lived with his parents and siblings in the more remote southern part of the island. Since his family was poor and could not afford a vehicle, they mostly traveled by foot or bicycle. My grandfather had a menial job selling newspapers at the time, so he would ride his bike to deliver them. Deciding to work extra hours one day, he ended up leaving for home after dusk, he lived on the outskirts of the town in a village that was known for its lush cane fields. Like any other day, he began his trek back, even though there were hardly any streetlights at the time. My grandfather, having been a smoker during his teen years, would light a match every now and then, just to see, as he walked with his bike down the dark road to his house, with cane fields and forests on each side. The moonlight gave a shine to the recently paved road, it made it a bit easier for him to see. As he continued on his way, he heard the faint sound of something knocking the pitch of the road. He turned around, but no one was there. It was odd. The only other sounds were that of the chirping crickets and frogs in the fields. My grandfather simply decided to continue on his way when the sound of something knocking on the road started up again. He was curious as to what it was, or where it was coming from, but kept walking now at a quicker pace. As the sound grew closer, he could spot just up ahead the figure of a woman coming down the opposite side of the road. The clacking sound grew louder, but at the same time, he was immediately engulfed with the sweet scent of roses. 
Both he and the woman drew closer to each other, as he could now see her a bit clearer, but could not see her face as it was covered by the brim of her hat. Her skirt was flowing as it dragged along the ground. My grandfather found it strange that the woman, instead of walking entirely on the road, she kept one of her feet in the grass and the other on the pitch as she moved along. The scent of her perfume and the clacking sound as if a horse was trotting down the road faded away as they both passed by each other, heading in opposite directions. My grandfather was more confused than spooked, finding it hard to wrap his mind around the fact that a young lady was walking the same route at that late hour when there were no other houses nearby. The sky was clear and my grandfather was nearing his home at that point, but not before he saw another figure up ahead. This time, it was on the same side of the road that he was. The closer he approached, the clearer the appearance of the figure became. Immense fear began to creep into his mind. It was the very same woman he had just passed minutes ago along the road. She was slowly walking right towards him. He was in such fright that he didn't know whether to stop or turn around as he kept heading in the same direction. He recognized her as she was wearing the very same outfit. The only difference this time was that there was no sound of a horse trotting, but the scent of roses still remained. Suddenly, the woman abruptly stopped as if awaiting for my grandfather to walk past her. Trying hard to maintain his composure, my grandfather politely uttered a meek, Good night to the strange woman as he walked by. As he did, he felt an ice-cold hand place itself on his shoulder and a seductive reply asking, Excuse me, boy, can you help me? Reluctant to face the woman, my grandfather did it anyway, but it was again hard to see her with the large hat still blocking her face. Would you be so kind as to give me a lift back to town? It's so far that I could sure use the help. The woman pleaded in a soft voice. Knowing the situation was beyond strange and wrong altogether, my grandfather replied, I I'm sorry, ma'am, but my bicycle can only carry one and my parents would be worried if I don't get home soon. There was silence from the woman for a moment as she didn't move a muscle, but stood facing my grandfather. Before my grandfather could turn and walk, the woman asked him yet another question. Mind if I have a light? This question baffled him greatly, seeing as the woman was in a stagnant position with no gesture of reaching for a cigarette or anything that would require a light. The wind had picked up a bit at this point, stirring the trees in the fields. My grandfather glared down as the wind blew and ruffled the woman's long flowing skirt. But what he saw terrified him. As her skirt shifted from the wind, my grandfather saw that her leg that stood off the road ended with a cloven hoof. Petrified with fear coursing its way through his body, my grandfather now knew that the woman who stood in his way was no woman. He was cold, sweating, and trembling at this point. He knew that his only way to escape was to distract whatever this thing was and make a run for home. With trembling hands, he reached for and pulled the box of matches out of his pocket. The moment he struck the match and the sudden burst of flame appeared, the woman glared up at my father and finally revealed a face that appeared to be rotting. After witnessing the spirit's hideous form, my grandfather immediately turned and bolted down the road as fast as he could, leaving his bike behind. Without looking back, he heard a sinister laugh, followed by the sound of the trampling of the woman's hoof along the road as she chased after him. My grandfather shouted for his parents the closer he approached the house, his legs couldn't carry him any faster as the terrifying laughter and trotting sound of the hoof kept pace with him. It wasn't until he made it into his yard that the noises stopped. His parents raced out of the house in concern to find their son distraught and pale with fear, struggling to make it up the front yard's walkway. 
only until my grandfather was in the safe embrace of his parents. With tears coming down his face, did he dare to look back. However, all he saw was an empty stretch of road and the darkness that engulfed it. My grandfather and his family relocated to the northern part of the island shortly after, to a much more populated area. As for the La Diablesse herself, there was no doubt in his mind that she still haunts the empty streets, just waiting for her next unsuspecting victim. The Last Call from Jessica Location Unknown This happened a while back. I was talking on the phone with a friend of mine. At the time, he was parked in his car in front of a forest. He had pulled over to chat with me. It was already dark out, and we were just catching up on some things. Suddenly, he interrupts the conversation, and his voice becomes a bit shaky. Hey, he said on the other end. There's, there's something walking towards me. The moment he said that, Something struck me. It was like a cloud of dread just fell over me. I began to shake and have a panic attack, and I had no reason to. But he continued, I don't know what it is, but it just came out of the woods. I quickly told him to just drive home, but he insisted that he felt that he needed to stay and see if it was someone who needed help. I heard him get out of the car, and he went to go check on it, after a little while, he told me this person that he was looking at was very, very tall. I became more and more anxious the further he got to it. I couldn't see the situation unfold, but I could hear it, and my heart was pounding. The next thing I knew, I heard my friend screaming from the other end. Then he spoke again. It's crawling. It's in the grass somewhere. I can't see it. It's crawling. He was freaking out. I knew that area he was talking about, and around the tree line the grass was very high. If a person ducked down, you would not be able to see them. Then the other end went quiet. There were several seconds of silence before my friend spoke to it. Hello? D do you need help? Get away from it, I said to him. J just get away from it. Finally, I heard him walk back to his car and close the door. He told me that he was driving away now, that he didn't feel safe there. But when he was back on the road, I heard him breathe. Oh my god. What is it? I asked. There's a row of rocks in the middle of the road. They weren't here before. My friend was stuck. Then I heard him exit the car, and he approached them. I'm going to try to move them. Before I could tell him that that was a bad idea, that he should just turn around, the call was dropped. I was left there, lying alone in the dark, wondering what happened to him. His car was found on the middle of the road, but as of yet, there's no trace of him. Do you see it? From Necronancy, location unknown. My family's house isn't one of those stereotypical houses that was built in the middle of the woods where there isn't anyone for miles. But we do have a decently sized forest surrounding the property. We moved here due to my husband having to relocate for work, and while I was a bit uncomfortable with the new location, I've grown attached to the silence and serenity we had, which was different from living in the city like before. We've been living here for close to two years as of writing this, and in that time, we were incredibly happy. We had a backyard that was big enough for our son to play in, and that allowed us to get a dog. I was able to take up my long-time desire to learn archery, and my husband loved his job and was making a rather substantial amount of money. Our neighbors were incredibly nice. The local school was excellent and very accommodating, and I found a good job working as a secretarial assistant. For lack of a better word, things were perfect. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. My husband's job is very laborious, and he often comes home worn out from the physical demands. 
As a family, we understand that he works to provide the best life for us that he can, and we do not complain when he comes home and wants to sit on the porch and drink a few beers. He always makes sure to spend a little bit of time with our son and I before kicking his boots off and heading outside. One night, however, he was different. I saw his car pull into the driveway, and after a few minutes, he never came inside. I went to the front door and saw him standing on the porch completely motionless, staring across the yard and into the trees. Concerned that he had a bad day at work, I went out into the porch and rubbed his shoulders. Is everything okay, babe? Do you see it? He asked me that question almost immediately after mine, and his voice was cold and almost a whisper. He didn't blink or break his gaze from the trees. I looked out towards the woods and saw nothing but the trees and the darkness of the woodland canopy. Aside from the branches swaying in the evening breeze, there was no movement. I don't see anything. He didn't say anything else to me, and he still didn't move. I know my husband very well, and whenever he's upset, he likes to be left alone for a while. So I left his side and went inside. I figured after a little bit, he would rationalize whatever was upsetting him and come inside to talk about it. As I headed back inside, Priscilla, our dog, shoved her way past my legs and ran outside. I escorted our son away from the front door, assuring him that dad would be inside in a moment. But after an hour, he still hadn't come in. I was getting more and more concerned. I looked through the front window and saw him standing in the same position as he was before, almost statuesque. Priscilla was running around in front of him, wagging her tail and demanding affection, but he didn't even look at her, which was incredibly odd as he absolutely loved that dog. I went to the refrigerator and got a beer, and I took it outside. Honey, do you want a beer? Do you see it? It was the same question as before, asked in the same almost whisper immediately after I spoke, nearly interrupting me. My skin crawled. We had been together for seven years and I've never seen him act this way. I walked over beside him once again and peered into the darkness. I was hoping I would be able to see it now, whatever he was so fixated on. Perhaps I'd missed it, but just as before I didn't see a thing but the same woodline, the same trees I'd seen every day since we'd moved here. Dear, what are you looking at? I don't see anything. Do you see it? He said. I got irritated and walked away, laying the beer down on the patio table sitting right outside the front door and went inside. I didn't know if this was some joke or whether my husband was actually upset, but regardless, his behavior was starting to get on my nerves. After consoling our son a second time, assuring him that dad was okay, I started making dinner. I was beginning to let my mind wander, trying to forget my husband's very strange and irrational behavior, when a high-pitched yelp from outside snapped me back into reality. I remembered Priscilla was still outside with my husband, and panic kicked in. I rushed outside to see my husband still standing in the same position he had been. But Priscilla was no longer running around playfully. She had retreated to underneath one of the patio chairs with her tail between her legs and ears pinned down. I went to pet her and she flinched away from me, looking at me with sad and pain-filled eyes. Although I hadn't seen what happened, but my gut assured me that I knew exactly what it was. What did you do to Priscilla? At first, I thought I'd gotten through to my husband. I couldn't see his facial expression as I was shouting at the back of his head while attempting to coax Priscilla out of her hiding spot, but he stood there, motionless still, like all the times before, although this time he didn't say anything back. As my echoing shouts faded, I became fully aware of how quiet it was. There were no sounds at all outside. Not even the wind was making noise. It was deafening. I couldn't even hear my own heavy breathing or the faint ringing from the depths of your ears when everything is quiet. Then, without warning, he spoke. Go get my rifle. His demand was so sudden. 
Everything I once feared about having something like that in the house resurfaced. My husband had been pushed to the edge for whatever reason, and I feared he was going to do something terrible. For the first time ever, I was scared of my husband. I feared that he would do something to Priscilla, himself, me, or even our son. I quickly shielded Priscilla, as if he already had the rival. I was prepared to be the new target of his aggression, but nothing happened. I looked back and he still hadn't moved. He still stood in the spot, staring at the trees. I cautiously rose to my feet and managed to get a hold of Priscilla's collar. I began to guide her inside. Babe, please, is everything okay with you? Do you see it? I got Priscilla inside and she ran off. I slowly backed my way into the house, keeping a watchful eye on my husband. I was terrified. I wanted to get our son and Priscilla into the car and leave, but I was so worried that that would push him over the edge. I thought about hiding somewhere where he couldn't find us. I was trembling. I eased the door closed and just before it shut, he asked me again, go get the rifle. With the door closed, my mind raced faster than anything I'd ever felt, and my heart was beating faster than ever. I didn't know what to do. I grabbed our son and Priscilla and ushered them into our bedroom. I shut and locked the door and went to calm our son, who had begun crying at this point. Nothing made sense, and the one person I needed more than ever was the root of the problem. I called the police. I didn't want to harm our husband, but I had to do something. The dispatcher asked where we were and told us to stay there. She asked where the weapon was, and I assured her it was in the bedroom with us. She asked if I could see my husband from the window. I went to the window that overlooked the front yard to see, but before I saw him, I saw it. The night sky draped it in darkness, but I could definitely see its figure, and it was big much bigger than any animal that should have been in this area. It laid low to the ground like a predator stalking its prey. Although it wasn't moving, its legs were pulled in tight, ready to maneuver or pounce at a moment's notice. Its tail was long and coiled, lying flat on the ground. The only thing I could distinctly see were its eyes. They were massive, and they were glowing a darkish yellow. They were affixed on the sides of its head, spread far apart. They were fixated on the front porch, right where my husband was. I told the dispatcher to hurry, and I hung up. I grabbed the rifle, and I barked at our son to hide under the bed before I exited the bedroom. I sprinted for the front door and stopped. I didn't want to startle the creature, so I composed myself and calmly walked outside. Do you see it? Yes, I do. Did you get the rifle? I calmly handed the weapon over to him. What is it? I squinted into the darkness to try and get a better look, but all I could see were the two massive yellow orbs. I don't know, my husband said, but it's been moving closer. We played this silent game until the cops arrived. After an unsettling back and forth, the cops changed their objective. Soon they were scanning the forest around our home, as my husband was no longer a suspect. They found nothing. When they left, the two of us did in fact see that the tree line was empty as it should have been. But my husband knows that it will be back, and it will be closer than before. Shadow Lurker in the Woods, from Sarah H. Location, unknown. I was in high school, and I was experiencing my first lick of I Have a Car Freedom with my friends late one summer night. It was around 2 a.m. when my other friends called it quits and decided to head home, but my friends Gabby and Kevin decided we wanted to stay out. As our group split up, Gabby, Kevin, and I piled into my car and thought about what we should do next. We unanimously agreed that the town's park would be fun. The park is surrounded by a small forest that has been long since a place for satanic rituals and witchcraft. 
a woman whose house was bordering those woods, once woke up to find a large upside-down cross sprinkled with red fluid in her yard. In short, it's a very dark place. The three of us made the drive to the parking lot by the main trail of the woods and stepped out. Kevin, being a photographer, hurried out into the woods to take some nighttime shots before Gabby and I could even fully exit the car. We rolled our eyes at him and laughed as we trudged toward the trailhead. As we entered the woods, we were engulfed in pinch black darkness. I'm talking eternal pit of darkness black. Gabby and I turned on our little cell phone lights and scanned the trail for Kevin, but there was no sign of him. We waited a few moments before a light appeared a little off the left-hand side of the trail. A little relieved to have found our friend, we laughed. The three of us had this ongoing joke of making light signals to one another at random times. We signaled back to him, and what we assumed was Kevin reciprocated the light. This continued on for a few seconds as Gabby and I started inching forward toward the light. A few more moments pass and we see a tall silhouette emerge from the shadows. To our horror, that was Kevin walking towards us. Whatever was making that light bounded into the middle of the path. We gasped. It was tall, I mean really freaking tall, about seven feet, and it was made of complete darkness. The light gone, and the lights we had shining on it didn't reflect at all. It made the seven to eight pace dash from the left side of the path to the right and into the woods in a meager two paces. Gabby and I gasped for air as Kevin processed the situation, and we all made a mad dash back to the car. I drove out of there as fast as I could, and after that night, we all made a promise to never return to those woods past dark again. Mansion in the Woods from CLTK, location, Australia. My 47-year-old mother used to be an animal catcher. She had to go to some creepy places all around Australia. She had a lot of creepy experiences, but nothing prepared her for this. Her boss had told her to go to a jungle-like area in the middle of the night to trap some bats. My mom was scared and she asked her sister to come with her. They drove to the jungle, making their way through the dense underbrush. Before long, they made it to a small clearing where there was a swing set. This was odd, especially because one of the swings was moving slowly as if the wind had pushed it, but the forest around them was so thick that the wind could not be felt there. My mom was already creeped out by this place. Her sister managed to keep her going though. Halfway in the forest, they saw ripped up garbage bags with tons of nasty books scattered along the ground. Now my mom was really starting to rethink her decision to come here. A few hours later, they came across a mansion, an old place that she had heard about but never seen before. It was absolutely falling apart and was covered in vines. My much braver aunt pleaded her to come in and check it out together, and eventually my mother agreed to go inside. Inside the mansion, it was silent, but a few seconds later, they heard what sounded like a radio. Hello? My mother called out, but there was no reply. They decided it may be best to just leave, but as they did, they saw a figure in the window, one that seemed to nod at them. They made their way back to where they parked their vehicle, but saw human-like shadows all the way there. At one point, they were running and nearly screaming until they made it out of that jungle forest area and they never had to come back. Something Outside Our Tent From Trinity L Location Unknown It was a rainy Friday night. My friend Maddie was over to stay the night with us. We took my tent and set it up in the backyard, right in front of the tree line. Once everything was set up, it was about 10 p.m., and we decided to have a late dinner. Then we went to sleep in our sleeping bags. It must have been around midnight when I woke up, and I heard a very eerie sound. 
It was like snarling. I froze. I was filled with dread, wondering what on earth was outside the tent. Maddie nearly startled me when she spoke. What do you think it is? I looked at her, and I shook my head. I was about to reply to her vocally when something interrupted us. It was the loudest, most terrifying, ear-piercing howl. I nearly jumped out of my sleeping bag. The howl was so close that it had the two of us crying. About an hour later, just when we thought it was gone, something began to paw at and push around the tent. I gathered my courage, unzipped the flap just a little bit, and looked out. What I saw, I couldn't believe. There were these two things that looked like large wolves wandering about our camp, but their front paws were human-like, having fingers. To my horror, all at once, both of them snapped their heads towards me and stared me down. I quickly zipped the flap back up and huddled with Maddie. We waited until we saw sunlight, then waited another couple of hours just to be sure. When we crawled out, those creatures were gone. We were left wondering what in the world they were. Corner of my eye from Julius B. Location, North Carolina. It was a Saturday, and we had a big event to get to at around 8, which is why I had to wake up early. We were all doing the usual morning chores, and my aunt asked me to take the dog out. So I took the dog out to the front yard. I was all tired and groggy at the time. I'm sitting there waiting for the dog to do its business. When I see something move by a tree in the corner of my eye, I turn and I swear I see this shadowy figure darting back to cover. I thought, I'm just tired, I'm seeing things. But as I continue to sit there, I swear I can still see it. When I turn, I definitely caught a glimpse of something. I call the dog over and we bolt back to the door together, slamming the door shut behind me. I almost thought I let the dog out in my hurry, but that's not the scariest part of the story. As I looked through the sheet of my aunt's window, I saw what would traumatize me for a while. It wasn't just a flash now. I saw what nearly looked human, but it was covered in black, like some sort of black void. No color to it at all, just blackness. It was broad daylight by then, but this thing seemed to absorb all light. It walked along the forest's edge and disappeared. I will say there is a big forest here known for strange happenings. I don't know whether to chalk this up to the paranormal or some strange animal, I honestly couldn't tell you. I'm going back up there this May, so hopefully nothing happens this time. I don't want to be scared of going outside again. Copycat Ghost from Lunar Wolf 05. Location, South Carolina. I wish I had more information in this story. It was a very brief encounter but one that will always stay with me ever since I was young. It may not be one of the most eventful, but it definitely creeped me out. When I was six or seven years old, my family lived in an old house with a few dogs in South Carolina. It was far from uneventful there. I heard lots of strange noises and saw weird lights and such outside our house. I was absolutely convinced the place was haunted. As it turns out, I may not have been wrong about that. One of the weirdest things that ever happened to me happened outside of the house. I used to go outside a lot back then. I loved being outside and loved the feeling of being out there regardless of how warm or cold it was, but I usually came back in before it got too late. Obviously, I didn't stay out in the middle of the night, but one day, I decided I would stay out a little bit longer, well into the evening. It was getting around 6.30 when I finally decided to go back inside that day, but before I did, I was interrupted by something quite strange. You see, above my house was this sort of hill past a road that went through a thick forest. Up there was a neighborhood. Plenty of people lived there, 
at least for some nowhere southern town. Up there was a strange figure. It was tall, maybe six feet, but it was hard to tell where it was standing, and due to time, my memories are a bit vague. I sat there, staggered in disbelief. It was a tall, pitch-black humanoid figure looming over me, just over the hill. It was blank, just a black sort of shadow. It looked a bit distorted as well, like the shadow was moving around like TV static, if that makes sense. Me being young and confused, I was stunned. It was so bizarre. I didn't know what to do, but the door was right behind me, so I could run in back to my parents at any moment. I felt safe for that reason. I waved at the figure as it stood there, and it gave me a little wave back after a few seconds. I was so creeped out that chills went down my spine. It looked human, and now it was acting human. I started making other motions, and the thing copied each and every one of them. I even walked closer and poked behind a tree, and it pretended to do the same. Even though there was no tree where it was, I was kind of amused, actually. Realizing I would probably seem like a madman making weird motions to anybody that saw me, I looked around to see if anyone was looking. When I looked back, the creature was gone. The way it just stood there at first and then copied my every motion was so strange, and I never saw anything like it again. I'm certain there's probably an explanation somewhere out there, but until then, this is my paranormal experience. Dad? From RJ. Location? Unknown. I was about five years old. My family lived in a rural region. All the houses were very far apart. We were no strangers to all sorts of wildlife either. My dad built a 10 foot high wire fence with a gate so he could access the woods around the backyard. He was a bit overprotective. One day I was playing in a pile of sand next to the fence. I had my favorite toy, a red pickup truck. Dad suddenly walked by, walked over to the gate, opened it and said, would you like to go get firewood with me? I shook my head as I was busy playing with my pickup truck so he closed the gate and went on his way in the woods. A few hours passed by and he returned, dragging a big branch behind him. He left it in front of the door and got into the house. I was back to doing my business in no time. Just as I got bored and stood up, I heard a rustling sound from the tree line. Then I saw my dad coming out of the forest, again. I was confused and a little scared. As he got close to the fence, my heart skipped a beat. Would you like to get firewood with me? It sounded like my dad. At this point, I was afraid to move, and it said it again and again and again, begging me to come over to that side to get firewood with him. Every time he said it, he looked less like my dad, and more like a caricature of him. I turned my head towards the house, silently begging for help. I couldn't bring myself to speak. When I turned back, the thing that looked like my dad no longer looked human at all. It had pale skin, ears that were pointed, and a face that was more an amalgamation of random features than a human face. Then it screamed, and I blacked out. I woke up an unknown amount of time later in our living room. It was a relief except for the fact that for a long time after that, I was scared to be around my own dad. Sometimes at night, I swear I can still hear the screams. Something in the Woods, from Megan M. 2001, location, Minnesota. It was last spring. My boyfriend and I went to my cabin alone, it's in a small town in Minnesota out in the middle of nowhere, and the closest neighbor was about four miles away. It was our second night there, and my boyfriend, T, was making dinner. I was trying to set up the DVD player so we could watch some movies. While I was doing that, T dropped the bowl and was frozen, staring out the window. He then looked at me 
and it was the most scared I'd ever seen him. He told me to come over and look outside. I did so, and I froze just like he did. There was this thing outside, maybe 15 feet from the cabin. The best I could describe it was like a skinny, sick bear without fur. This was definitely no bear, though. It stood up on two legs, and it reached about eight feet. It made this horrible scream that made me cover my ears, then it quickly snapped its neck to look at T and I. That's when I backed up. For about five minutes, we stared at each other, and I swear to God, that thing smiled at us. It had so many sharp teeth in its maw. It screamed again, then fell to four legs and ran back into the woods. T and I just looked at each other in shock, and we quickly packed up. We were going to leave first thing in the morning because we were so creeped out. We went to bed around 11.30, but while we were sleeping, we woke up to a scratching sound from outside the cabin. It was about 4 a.m. then. I screamed at it to go away when I suddenly heard what sounded like a laugh before things went silent again. In the morning with the sunlight, T and I went outside and around the cabin. There we found claw marks. They were also covering our car. Whatever that thing was, it was angry. We won't be going back to that cabin for a long time. If you go into the woods today, you'd better be packing. There's not just bears and coyotes to look out for. Because, for some odd reason or another, beings beyond our understanding love the woods and seem to spend all of their time there, unless they take a break to come and torment the poor folks who wander too close to the tree line. Good night. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you've got a story you want to share, send it to us at darknessprevails.org. And if you want to support the channel, you can go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails or get some of our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darknessprevails. Or it's as easy as clicking the shop button below this video if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about five true scary stories from New York. Frozen Raichu says, My brother passed away last night. My twin brother. Then we had a car crash on our way to tell my grandma. Thanks for uploading today. I needed this. I don't think many people can understand the pain you go through losing a sibling. I can't imagine losing a sibling that's your twin either. I wish you and your family the best, and I'm ever so grateful and thankful that what I do here can help in any way. Baby AB Hunting for the Truth says, do New Jersey next. Well, it's only rational that I do New Jersey eventually. I mean, it's New Jersey. Mike Hintz says, the darkness prevails version of Home Alone Lost in New York. Oh yeah, now all we're missing is a creepy bird lady. VCVC Fan says, oh, do Chicago next. That would be another scary easy one. I just gotta get around to doing a scary story from every state, and maybe eventually a story from every city. That'd be a lot of stories. And Catherine M says, I grew up in New York, so not much scares me. Not even the haunted daycare I work for. True story. Well, come on, submit that story, because it sounds way too juicy. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are coming soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one. <laughs>